grantees. We do have two past grantees that focused on beekeeping, uh, one in Haiti and one in Tanzania. I can't remember the one in Haiti, but the one in Tanzania is Africa, Africa people and wildlife. So check that out if you love bees, but I'm gonna go ahead and get this party started. Um, Wendy, I'm just double checking that you're recording. And I want to welcome everyone and ask if there are any new people to Together Women Rise. Is anybody new? I know Jenny is. Yes, I'm new. <laughs> anybody else? Okay, well, um, we, since we're still getting used to our new, our new name, um, I just want to share that Together Women Rise is a powerful community of women and allies dedicated to achieving global gender equality. We have hundreds of chapters across the US where members learn about gender equality issues, give grants to organizations that empower women and girls in low income countries and build community to forge meaningful connections with each other and with women and girls around the world. This is our monthly national webinar that is open to anyone who cares and wants to learn more about global gender equality. Now we are going to have um, um, Ellen, where's Ellen? Where did you go? Ellen Williams is going to read our what we call um, the dinner affirmation because our original um, way to meet is to meet around a potluck dinner. So Wendy, I think is going to share it on the screen. By the way, by the way uh, June, we have set for live interaction. So we're oh, hoping- that's, that's great to hear, Ellen. That's fantastic. But you can still come here oh. <laughs> too. You can do both. Thank you. <laughs> um, Wendy. Wendy is going to share um, the dinner affirmation on the screen any minute now. Looks like she had a little bit of. Um, I, yes, I, I got disconnected. So uh, I am just back now, though. OK. Let me just end, admit a couple of people here. Oh, great. We got a good crew. Okay. All right. All right, Ellen. Dinner affirmation. I have to move something. As we share food, we share something of ourselves and we honor each other. We recognize the powerful associations of women to food, life, and nurture in all cultures. We honor the importance of those. We also recognize the burdens they can bring. We remember the women about whom we've learned, the ones they strive to nurture and the organizations that are trying to nurture them. By eating together, we remember and honor those women who also have favorite foods and family recipes. And we express the hope that through our efforts, they may find more sustenance for their lives. May we all be able to feast together someday. Thank you, Ellen. Um, Ellen and I had the opportunity to feast with um, some of our grantees in Bhutan and almost two years ago, uh, which is very surprising, but uh, that is a wonderful part of our organization is our travel program, which um, will be up and running again as soon as possible. So uh, just a few things, if you don't know how to mute, uh, please stay muted during this. If you're not a speaker, go to the top right corner of your um, little picture and you can find the mute button. 
also pay attention to the chat, which if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen is the little speaker, um, little speaker bubble and people can um, say hello to each other, introduce yourselves, um, but most importantly, ask questions. So, um, and then also you can do speaker or gallery view. If you go to the top right corner of your Zoom screen, there's a button that says view. If you press on that, it says speaker view and the person that's speaking will be right there with you. Or you can do gallery view where you can see everybody. So tonight I'm very excited to introduce Tara Wody. This month, um, Tara Wodi is our featured project in Uganda. And through this project, we're helping women rebuild their lives after experiencing obstetric fistula, which is a debilitating childbirth injury most common in women in lower income countries with limited access to quality obstetric care. Our grant from Together Women Rise will address the social, emotional, and economic consequences of fistula, uh, the discrimination, the stigma, shaming, social isolation, high rates of divorce, abandonment, and, and economic impact. This project addresses two of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, number three, which is good health and well being, and number five, which is gender equality. We're so lucky tonight to have two representatives from Terawodi to share about this project and the impact of our donations. And we're going to start with playing the short video. And while you watch the video, please take the opportunity to write questions in the chat because afterwards I'll introduce our speakers and they will address your questions. And here goes the video. So when I got pregnant, my boyfriend left me. He was fearing that my parents could take him to prison. During the time of delivery, I got a fistula. Have you ever seen a woman who has a fistula? You can't be with the community. I feared even to go to the market because I was smelly. I didn't even want that wife of mine anymore. I didn't even like to eat her food. My friends were advising me not to bring her back. They were telling me to get another woman. Even my dear husband rejected me. And he got another wife. I had no one to stay with. Even my baby passed away. So I said, what can I do? I was thinking of committing suicide and I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where to start from, but one woman talked to my wife and told me that problem could be treated. I said, where can I get all that money? She told me, no, just calm down. Terewode is going to do that for you. After Terewode treated me, I was taken undergo a training in Soroti. I started making bids for earning money. That bid making enabled me to earn a living and I was also somebody when I came back to the village. Because of the knowledge she got from Terewode, she's a tailor and she's been given contracts to make uniforms for secondary schools. Five of my children have completed their education. Three of them are teachers and one of them is an engineer. In Uganda, at least 16 women die every day 
due to complications of childbirth. At least the two to three are ending up with a fistula. We had so many women who were suffering from fistula, but because of the help of Terode and other partners, they have healed and they have been integrated with their families. They have cried and cried and cried. Terode is more than my mother, is more than my father. If they were not there, I was going to lose my child, I was just going to lose my life. This is going to change our lives. This is going to change our nutrition. This is going to change our families. Nowadays, I don't want to cry. I want others to see from me I'm not a champion. Our friends outside Uganda, thank you very much for much support you're giving to us. Thank you. I, I love this video, Carolyn and Bonnie. It is, it's, first of all, it's just beautiful. The people that you have in it, it's so uh, colorful and you've really done a great job of, of balancing, um, you know, the, the hard work with the joy of what they're experiencing. So I'm really excited to introduce uh, Dr. Dr. Bonnie Reuter, who is the co-founder and executive director of Terawodi Women's Fund, which is the U.S.-based um, nonprofit at, 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 of uh, Terawodi. She's a senior research consultant with the International Fistula Alliance, and she sits on the board of governors for the Terawodi Women's Community Hospital. She conducts research on maternal health and obstetric fistula and has worked on projects in Uganda, Somalia, the Gambia, Zimbabwe, and the US. Her research focuses on obstetric fistula, residual incontinence, uh, post fistula repair, maternal and infant health, reproductive justice, traditional birth attendance, social justice and systems of oppression and community engaged research. She's also a licensed midwife with over 20 years experience. And um, she's also attended births in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake and at a um, referral hospital in Uganda. She is now also focusing on examining the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on gender and maternal health in Uganda. Uh, and we also have Dr. Carolyn Anderman, who is an epidemiologist who's worked on maternal and child health issues in the US and internationally. Um, she served as the director of international programs for One by One, which is now Worldwide Fistula Fund, um, and which is also a U.S.-based NGO dedicated to the prevention of obstetric fistula. She worked closely with partners in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and Ethiopia to design, implement, and evaluate innovative community projects, approaches for increasing access to safe childbirth and life transforming fistula treatment services. And in 2020, she joined the board of Terawodi and is currently the board president. And I, obviously you both have an incredible experience and expertise to talk about this. And I think it's really interesting because so many um, 
I, that everyone uh, who has ever had a child has experienced um, different complications or effects after um, birth and um, from incontinence to ongoing pain and all of those things. Most of us are able to get that kind of treatment um, and it might be hard for us to imagine what a life would be like if we couldn't get that kind of treatment. And so I'm, I'm just really grateful for what you're doing. And it looks like we have quite a number of questions for you. So I think Thanks. Wendy's going to guide those, but I, we welcome you to um, share anything you'd like and we'll follow up with the questions. Well, great. Thank you. I would first just want to say how um, grateful we are to um, be here tonight and uh, to have the support of Together Women Rise for Terwode. Um, yeah, it's really a joy to share about Terwode's program. And I was just going to start off by telling a little bit like how I got involved um, with Terwode. So in 2010, I actually met Alice in um, St. Louis, she was finishing up her master's in social work, and I was introduced to her by another official a surgeon and researcher there at WashU. And right away, within the hour, Alice invited me and my family to come to Uganda to work with Terwode and to conduct research with fistula survivors. So we did. In 2011, I went with my husband and my two boys, who were 11 and 8 at the time, and we moved to Sarodi for the winter, which was quite a uh, family experience. And I've been involved with Terode ever since. Like my whole family has been really. We just um, fell in love with Alice and the Terode team. They became like family to us. And at that point, they were much more grassroots. This is like, you know, years ago. So they were the most dedicated women I'd ever met to, um, you know, they, a lot of the staff didn't have much themselves, but they were so dedicated to making sure women with fistula not only got treatment, but also got the counseling and economic empowerment and training to restart their lives. And um, so yeah, I came back to the States and, you know, kept working with Alice over the years and eventually um, co-founded Terwode Women's Fund to try to get support in the U.S., financial support for them to help um, do their programs. So maybe Carolyn, do you want to introduce yourself now? Sure. Yeah, let me, um, let me add my thanks to, to all of you for your, your interest in this work. Um, and for giving us the opportunity to spend this time with you um, this evening. Um, I, um, as was mentioned, I joined the board of Terawode Women's Fund just last year, but I actually um, have been familiar with Terawode, um, Terawode's work for a long time. Um, I was for many years um, working with another organization, um, one by one, also dedicated to the treatment and prevention of obstetric fistula. Um, and we, we had, we worked in many different countries and Tara Wood, was one of our grantees. Um, so I was able to get to know Tara Wood and Alice's remarkable work really well during that time. Um, so I was, I was, I was introduced to, um, obstetric fistula as an issue in 2009. Um, and I was amazed that as someone who had worked in public health, um, for a long time, I had never heard of it. Um, and I, I quickly came to see it as really one of the most devastating conditions affecting the most vulnerable women and girls in the world. Um, and I met my first fistula patient in 2010, the very next year. Her, and I want just to tell you a little bit about her because she had such an impact on me. Her name was Sylvia. She lived in remote Western Kenya and she was 72 when we met her. Um, she had developed a fistula when she was 20 years old. She lost her baby and she went on to live with fistula for 52 years. And I thought, I was just so stunned by that, that, that that women still get this injury. Um, it was actually eradicated in this country over a hundred years ago. Um, that women still get this injury, but then they live with it for years and decades. And that just seemed wrong. So 
I, um, meeting Sylvia and hearing her story of having had such an isolated life with so much shame, so much unnecessary suffering really solidified my, my commitment, my personal commitment to doing whatever I could to help end this suffering, this unnecessary suffering in the world. Um, so as you all know by now, thankfully, obstetric fistula is both treatable and preventable. And I have to say that I, I think that Tara Wooday is, the work they do is, is really the gold standard in holistic care for women. Um, you know, there are lots of facilities in, in Uganda and in the world that do fistula repair, that, do, that provide the surgery. Um, but you, as you've probably learned from other materials we've, you know, we've submitted, it's the, the fistula surgery is really, it's essential. It's, a, it's the critical first step but it's really, in so many cases, it's not enough. You know, the goal is not just to close a hole that shouldn't be there in a woman, but is to really give a woman the opportunity to resume a productive life. And, and Tara Wooday's holistic approach, you know, really dealing with the trauma, giving a woman the tools, empowering her to, um, to build a, a new life for herself is, is really what's needed. And so it is, it is, so when I was asked to join the board last year of Tara Wooday Women's Fund, it was, um, I jumped at the chance. It was, um, I'm so proud of the work that Tara Wooday does. And um, I want to, I want to thank you all for, um, for, again, for your interest and your support of this work. It is, um, it does truly transform women's lives. Um, so thank you. <laughs> And Bonnie and I know would, would be happy to answer any questions you have. All right, I'm happy to, um, to start to go through these questions that have been coming in. Um, I'll take them sort of in order. The first one is, how much is the fistula problem a result of um, FGM or FGC? which is female genital mutilation or female genital cutting for those who aren't aware. You know, in, luckily in Uganda, um, FGM isn't really a problem. There's a very low incidence of um, FGM in Uganda and only one region. Um, but there, there's not a lot of connection. Um, it's actually more um, the problem is more when the baby's trying to make it through the um, pelvis. So it's actually a bone, like the fetal head to the, um, the rim of the um, maternal pelvis. So it's a bone to bone issue in most cases, or it can be um, a fetal malpresentation, like the baby might be lying completely transverse and the mom just needs a C-section. So um, I think with the really severe, the like, um, most severe type of FGM that can slow birth down, but it's usually not the cause of fistula. So the next question we have, um, can you give some idea of the percentage of fistulas that are due to child marriage where a young woman, woman's body is simply not ready for childbirth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Uganda has actually a really high um, teen pregnancy and child marriage rate. It's one of the highest in Africa, um, sadly. And that definitely contributes to the problem. I'd, I think it was like um, between 65 and 70% of the women Terode um, sees it's their first pregnancy and that causes the fistula. And we did a study on the young women and um, there, I think with that study, it was 64% of them had given birth at what they considered um, teens, a teen birth um, and that caused the fistula. The other um, group that gets the fistula though is the, um, we call them grand multips. It's women who've had many babies, so five or more babies. And those women have had 
like in Uganda, kind of baby after baby after baby, and their uterus is pretty stretched out. And so then it doesn't hold the baby into the correct position. And that's when you get like a transverse or just a slight, slightly off kilter um, baby trying to make it through the pelvis. And in both circumstances, those moms need um, a C-section and just as they're not able to get one in time. And the only thing I would add to that is, is that, you know, even though, I mean, Bonnie's of course completely right that very young women, really they're girls um, mm -hmm. and much older women can develop fistula, a woman can develop a fistula at any age. Mm -hmm. And, and that, you know, that, that any woman anywhere in the world actually can experience prolonged obstructed labor. There are probably many women on this call that have experienced prolonged obstructed labor, but it's, or have experienced obstructed labor. But here, of course, we have access to intervention, usually in the form of a C-section. And, um, and in Uganda and other places, that's not the case. So, but, 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 but everybody, you know, anyone can, you know, can develop a fistula at any age. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads right into the next question because someone was wondering about the future of getting more hospitals in Uganda able to provide mm. C-sections. Can you comment on, on that one? There's maybe going to be some hope <laughs> in the future for, for this being a, a possibility for more women? Yeah. Yeah, that is definitely, um, Alice Masu, who you saw in the video, who's the executive director of Terrode, um, she is definitely a, a visionary and she's already got her, um, you know, is thinking about next steps and how do we really prevent fistula? Like we can't just keep treating it. We need to prevent it. So there is already um, plans. Um, they'll become more concrete in the next um, few years, but plans to have a maternity center at the hospital on the grounds. But in the meantime, she, Alice is really active in um, putting pressure on the, um, Ministry of Health and the government in Uganda to improve maternal health um, services across the country, because that the um, maternal mortality rate in Uganda is still uh, ridiculously high. It's just unacceptable. It's 436 maternal deaths per 100,000 births. So they, you know, need to invest a lot more money across the country um, to deliver quality maternity care and especially this emergency obstetric care and C-sections. So while she's doing the, you know, pressure on the Ministry of Health at the same time, she's starting to plan for, uh, you know, a center of excellence maternity hospital that they could use to then do training and education for doctors nationwide. All right, that's great. Thank you. Um, this is a this is a, a question about the COVID situation in Uganda because someone was noticing that in the video no one was wearing masks. Now, um, maybe just it's good for our members to understand that that you probably submitted this video months and months ago, <laughs> um, and and so in all likelihood the situation may have even changed in that time. But currently, what is happening? in Uganda in terms of the COVID pandemic and how is that affecting your own programs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the footage in the video was taken um, before COVID. So, um, and, you know, right now, you know, Africa, it's one of the, it's kind of interesting that we think that Africa is doing pretty well overall. And I'm saying that um, with a few outlying countries such as Kenya and South Africa. But at the same time, a lot of the countries in Uganda included and don't have the means to do a lot of testing. So um, it's a little bit unknown what the um, COVID uh, situation is, but uh, so far they have done better than a lot of other countries in um, the world, though, you know, we see how quickly that changed in India. So we're kind of, you know, keeping our fingers crossed that things remain um, positive in Uganda. They did go through a four month lockdown last year 
And during that time, the hospital had to close temporarily, which was, you know, a little bit devastating or heartbreaking because we had hadn't even been open a year. We opened the hospital in August of 2019. And then um, at the end of March of 2020, they had to shut down. Um, but they stayed busy through to like their nature, um, right away. They had a lot of survivors calling them. They, um, quickly decided that they were going to do, um, like virtual, like telephone call counseling to all the, there was a lot more, I think, stress nationwide and, uh, domestic violence. I mean, I think that happened here in the U S also our domestic violence rates went up. So they were, um, really trying to reach out to survivors and they even gave like cash grants for women who needed to move and get to a safer um, place during the lockdown. Then the other thing that happened is the government, when they did this lockdown, they just stopped all public transportation, all private transportation. You had to get like some um, very specific permit uh, and what they forgot to think about were the women in labor. So the women who were going into labor during this lockdown had no way to get to the hospital. So there were women, um, there were reports of women walking like seven kilometers and dying on the way to the hospital just to give birth. Terwode took um, their two ambulances and um, turned those into, they got permission from the Ministry of Health they got some extra funding from all their partners, including Terwode Women's Fund, to use the ambulances to transport women in labor to the hospital. And then they would transport the mom and the baby um, couple back after the delivery. So they were busy all through COVID doing everything they could to both prevent fistula and support their survivors. And then in July, the hospital was able to reopen with all the COVID precautions in place. So now they're masks and they've got the san hand sanitizers everywhere and yeah, staying safe. Well, we hope that continues for sure. Um, what does the word Terawodi mean? Does it have a, a meaning? Uh, it's an acronym and it stands for the Association for the Rehabilitation and reorientation of women for development. <laughs> Ugandans really love acronyms. There's a lot of them if you go there. <laughs> I must say your acronym is, is it works out quite nice. It's, it, it sounds like it, yeah. you know, it wouldn't. Yeah, it does. A nice thing. Um, okay, next question. Have the views and attitudes of the husbands changed since the availability of this program transforms their wives. Mm. You want to answer that one, Carolyn? Sure. Um, I, my sense is that the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I think there's still lots of, lots of progress that still needs to be made. But, you know, one of the things that, you know, one of the important parts of Tara Wade's programs, you know, is community education. And so they have an incredible network of survivors and other people who um, spend time in the villages educating people about what fistula is, the fact that it's a medical condition and not some kind of spell that gets put on women um, and that it can be treated. And so I think that education has made a difference. And then when women come home after successful treatment um, and not only they have they been physically repaired, but they also have developed new skills and are able to take care of their families and contribute to their communities. I think that that has, you know, most certainly um, led to a shift in attitudes um, about fistula. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that, Bonnie. No, I think that's true. I mean, the, I guess the one other thing I'd add is um, Terwode will do um, couple counseling and marriage counseling and that um, they really, you know, try to bring the husband in and, you know, so they have a deeper understanding and try to like get the men to like empathize with the woman and, you know, walk in her shoes a little bit, which is just, it's not normally part of the Ugandan culture. It's, you know, so it's really helpful to the women. Great. 
We have a question about, can you share more information about how fistula can be prevented? I know there's a lot of discussion about cesarean sections as a, a way to prevent that, but can you talk about that a little bit more? Sure, I mean, part of Terawode's prevention um, program is um, really based on education. So, um, education in terms of like in the community on safe motherhood, um, trying to make sure women plan for their birth to deliver at a health facility and, you know, save money for the transportation to get to the health facility and then leave on time. So, you know, they're not getting there late after they've already been in labor for a day. So all those kind of personal things that the women can do. They do education programs at those schools and with, you know, in the community with parents about um, daughters needing to, you know, stay in school, finish secondary school, don't let them get married early, you know, um, that kind of, cause that can, is a huge um, way to prevent fistula. Um, and then I think the last is really pressuring um, the local healthcare system to deliver better care. Yeah. All right, the last question we have is, is specifically about the project that Together Women Rise is funding and um, that we are primarily funding the reintegration program. Um, we have certainly in the past had projects where we funded the actual surgery, but this one is kind of unique in that we're we're funding the, 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 the follow-up, the reintegration program. And someone would like to know um, a little bit more about that reintegration program, what it does, and what evidence you have of success of the program. Mm -hmm. um, so there's five key parts of the program. Um, so counseling is, I think, what starts immediately, like women um, start to share their story, um, which, um, and then each day they have individual counseling or group counseling. A lot of times for fistula survivors that are from, you know, really remote areas, this might be the first time they've met other women who have had fistula outside of the treatment. Um, and then they get health education. So how to take care of themselves and then also how to, um, if a lot of these, because a lot of these women are um, experiencing fistula after their first birth, they are going to want to go on and have more children. So how they can do that safely. Um, and then also information on family planning so they can space their um, pregnancies out, which is also safer and will help them prevent fistula. They do like a, a big piece on economic empowerment. So they get some economic like microfinance training and savings training they also kind of identify a skill and um income generating project that would work well in their community and then they get um, more in-depth training on that skill then they um also get some training on the advocacy and the rights and leadership and so then when they go back into the community uh Terwode has helped them form solidarity groups so the one of the amazing things about this program is it's not just like a two week program and then they never have contact with these women again. They go back into the community and they'll join solidarity groups, which will be fistula survivors, but also other women from the community. Terore, the staff and Alice thought if it's a, a larger women's group, one, they're gonna reach more women to teach them about safe motherhood and to advocate for their rights. But also the fishula, the women who had had fishula won't be stigmatized. They're just kind of collectively in this um, group. And so that, and that's a way that Terwode um, staff will reach out to that group throughout the year. They'll give them extra training in the microfinance if they're struggling with that or just need a, you know, some more support. Yeah, so the staff will reach out to them either by cell phone or they'll make field visits. They'll do extra training throughout the year. I think I haven't talked about the music, drama, and dance, which is another wonderful part of the Terawode program where they, um, and they start that right into in the reintegration. It's kind of, it's also, I feel like part of the counseling, like they learn these songs and act out these skits. And I think it's really healing for them. I mean, 
I've been told is really healing for them. So from the um, Terrebonne counselors hear that back from the women. And then they use that um, program to go out into the community and that's how they can educate people because they'll put on um, a drama performance and sing songs and the whole community will come to watch it. So. Uh, right, and, your, and your um, success rates, how do you measure your success in this program? Um, so we haven't done like a, um, uh, official study, but we are starting that this year. So they've mainly done success rates by, um, well, tracking the women that have gone through the program. And then they also track any official or reoccurrence or, um, and then the women also report back the solidarity group members. So they have like over 800 members right now in the 27 different groups. And then they track the income generating projects that they're doing and the groups that are doing, you know, like how their micro savings program is coming along and when they need support. So they track those different indicators. And then this year we're gonna do a, um, a research project on it that we hope to then publish the results in the future. Great, good. Um, and just for anyone who maybe hasn't seen the chat, there was a, a great book recommendation um, put in the chat. The book is um, called Cutting for Stone by Abraham, Ver I think it's Verghese, I'm guessing. Yes. yes. Verghese. Um, I, I have read that book and it is excellent. And it certainly does um, give you, it's a fiction book, but but it's um, it does also give you you know, some idea about um, obstetric fistula and and how it impacts women's lives. So uh, someone recommended that and and I heartily, heartily agree. Um, that is all the questions we have in the chat. And you know what, Beth Ellen, they are so hardworking. They're heading off to another Zoom with oh a chapter, the chapter in Bend, Oregon, I think. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're going to love them. Is, is that, um, no, I was going to say, is that, um, um, Karen McKeon's chapter, but I don't think it is. I think it's Judy. Judy's who's it's been Judy writing. Bacon. Judy Bacon. No, no. Yeah. Romano. Oh my God. Anyway, well, we don't need to go through. We could, we could spend all, all night. People, anyway, all these people are our friends in the community, so we're so glad you're getting um, to know some of us and the passion that we all have for these issues and your organization. So thank you so much, and have fun on your next um, Zoom call. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, very you much. both. Um, now we're going to talk about uh, our sustained grantee. Every month, as most of you know, we highlight two grants, our featured grantee, which is a grantee that is new to Together Women Rise, and our sustained grantee was previously um, part of our featured program, and then we have also um, awarded them a $75,000 three-year grant. And so this month we are highlighting um, a, a grandmother project, which has a long history with us for its work in Senegal. Um, their first grant with us was 2015. And so um, they are widely recognized for this really unique approach that uh, emphasizes the inclusion of elders, especially grandmothers, to strengthen communication between generations. And they are really doing groundbreaking work. Uh, that with our funds, they are expanding and strengthening its Girls Holistic Development Program, which promotes girls' education and decreases child marriage, female gen genital mutilation and cutting, and teenage pregnancy. So now we're going to show the video. We do not have a representative from um, the Sustain Grantee Grandmother Project, but um, we will be happy to um, answer any questions that we're able to after the video. Yes, and, and I mentioned to a few of you who were on early, excuse me while I 
move a pet out of the way. Um, Judy uh, Abel, the um, uh, executive director of Grandmother Project is in Rome, which would have meant 2.30 in the morning her time, but she sends her regrets. This is a video, this is not the video that is on our DVD um, and on our website. Judy recommended that we show this one because it really talks about the girls holistic program. And then I've got some quotes that she wanted me to share from grandmothers and their projects. So um, uh, right. this is a neat little five minute video. Um, I think does a great job. Thanks, Wendy. First, I better share my screen. Your cat really wants to be in the picture. She is really attached to me. Young girls have big dreams, and they are faced with many challenges, especially girls in Africa. In Senegal, boys' education is favored over girls. Going to school puts girls at risk for teen pregnancy, so many families remove them from school once they reach puberty. Traditionally, parents decide when girls will be married and strongly influence who they marry, often when girls are still under age 18. And female genital mutilation is still widely practiced, even though the law now forbids it in many countries. Many national and international organizations work to address girls' rights and well-being in countries where these issues are especially prevalent. These organizations often aim to empower girls to be able to protect themselves, to speak up for their rights and pursue their own life goals. But many of these organizations ignore African cultural norms and influences and many of their programs focus on just girls. Of course, empowering girls is a fine goal, but adolescent girls are still just girls. They can't change the world alone. These girls face big life decisions and need support from parents and elders. And empowering only girls can even heighten conflict between girls and their families if community elders aren't involved. Because it's the elders in non-Western societies who direct the social norms and the decisions related to girls' education, child marriage, and female genital mutilation. Grandmother Project Change Through Culture, an American and Senegalese NGO, has a unique approach to support girls, grounded in research and cultural study. In Africa, most families are still very close-knit and elders are respected. Girls are embedded in family, community, and cultural systems that interact to advise, set expectations, encourage, and challenge girls in adolescent life. In traditional cultures like these, some older cultural norms are harmful to girls. Elders can either perpetuate harmful traditions or those traditions can be revised, inspiring a cultural shift. Grandmother Project creates positive change through culture, involving not just girls, but also parents and elders, the ones with the power to either maintain tradition or promote change. Grandmother Project has discovered that grandmothers are an abundant and underutilized resource to support and protect girls as they grow up, collectively promoting and protecting girls' education and well-being. Change through culture means acknowledging the role and experience of grandmothers and elders and strengthening communication between generations. The Girls' Holistic Development Program empowers not just the girls, but involves the whole community, especially grandmothers. Grandmother leadership training increases their knowledge and empowers them to take collective action for their girls. To support girls and grandmothers, Grandmother Project organizes intergenerational forums, all-women forums, and fun activities for grandmothers and girls. 
Recent research shows that the Girls Holistic Development Program to involve grandmothers in supporting girls is not only an innovative approach, it is also a very effective approach. The research shows that the change through culture approach has contributed to more support for girls' education, less female genital mutilation, child marriage, and teen pregnancy, stronger communication between generations and between the genders. Empowered grandmothers have played a key role in catalyzing all of these changes. They are using their power and influence to change social norms in their communities. Grandmother Project empowers girls and grandmothers while increasing wider support for girls as they grow and dream. Thanks, Wendy. I love the um, that grand. There was a, a a still picture in there of the grandmother with her finger in the air, and she really had something to say. I loved that one. Let me just read a couple of these quotes, Beth Ellen, um, okay, because they, they're quite impactful. Um, so this is from grandmother um, Famata or Famata. We grandmothers, we had lost the voice for a long time. Today, thanks to this program, we have found this voice. We felt out of the community, but today the program has reinstated us and restored our dignity once scorned by those to whom we have given everything. The most illustrative evidence is that we are here in this meeting for the first time alongside the village chief, the imam, the teachers, and our beautiful granddaughters. We have regained our dignity. Let me read another one. They're all so awesome. From grandmother uh, Diabu, forgive me if I'm absolutely doing a horrible job with these names. Confidence builds power. Since I have become more confident, thanks to these training sessions, I no longer feel any sense of hesitation, particularly when there is something that needs to be done or said. I no longer bow my head when speaking before a group of men, quite the opposite, in fact. I always feel relaxed now when talking in a group because I feel more confident. Ugh, good shivers. I'm curious what what you all i mean this is a project we've had for a long time um what you all there are many grandmothers here um in in this group tonight how what do you all feel about this project can i just make an aside senegal was one of the leaders in covid in terms of arresting that disease and so they're doing something very good in senegal i've never been there but you know, you talk about this program, you talk about how they've leashed the COVID virus. So there's something in the nature of the people. I think it's awesome. And by the way, I'm a first time grandmother as of February. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Beth Ellen, the Grandmother Project was our first featured grantee in our chapter's very first meeting back in 2015 in March and we've had a really soft spot in our heart for it. All of us who are still members of our chapter can still remember the grandmother project from that first meeting. So I'm always happy to see it again. That's great. Uh, isn't it funny how we always remember like one of our, you know, our first grantee or for, from our first meetings. So I've heard that from so many members. That's wonderful. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions about the Grandmother Project? Lindy, are you wanting to say something? No, okay. Okay, well, um, I, I think that we all just love the Grandmother Project. Uh, I, I, I just think what they do is absolutely incredible and I know that they are looking to um, spread this philosophy um, to other countries in in Africa because it's such an effective tool 
utilizing the 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 strengths of a culture and really looking for those bright spots and how they can use a bright spot to um, to move issues forward for uh, gender equality. So um, that, that I think that that's a real exceptional situation and and a way to approach things. So I just want to wrap up with a few announcements. My, um, sorry, did someone want to say something? Yes, um, I was going to say about grandmothers. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, that I think it's wonderful to create that connection as as a country starts to modernize and urbanize, because uh, that, that's when you lose those connections between grandmothers and, and, and the, the whole family, the large family that in rural areas can live together. But often as people start going to work in the city, it gets lost. And grandmothers have a little more time than the mothers do. <laughs> um, so it, I think it's great to get that in place as a way of preserving some of those cultural strengths. Thank you, Diana. Diana's background is really in, in social work in this area and families. And she, she so you would know, and, Diana. Thank and you. I, and I have 17 grandchildren. <laughs> yes. yes, you're, you're a big mama. Yes. Big grandmama. <laughs> So thank you. So um, we're just going to wrap up. I just want to um, remind you that um, one way to celebrate Mother's Day is to make a gift to Together Women Rise in honor or in memory of your mother. On May 10th is our next book discussion. This is a really big deal, everybody. In the Time of Butterflies by Julia Alvarez is the book and the author is attending. Julia Alvarez is a very accomplished and well-known author. She's going to be joining us. I just, I think it's incredible and I can't wait to see her. This is free. This is also a great time to bring in a friend who maybe um, was curious about what we do. This is a great way to, to engage people who you know, have maybe quest, uh, ask questions about who we are. Uh, in May, we have advocacy webinars on May 18th at 7 p.m. Eastern and May 19th at 6 p.m. Pacific. And then on June 3rd is our next national chapter meeting at 8 p.m. The projects are Crayamos in Guatemala and um, another uh, sustained grantee close to our hearts, Ripple Africa in Malawi. Um, and add togetherwomenrise.org to the safe senders in your email program so that you can make sure to get the emails. Uh, and um, try to bring a friend next, next uh, month. We would love you to introduce your friends. That would be a wonderful thing. So uh, thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Thanks. And happy thank Mother's thank Day. You, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Grandmother's oh. Day.